and hello again. Now today we're going to have a look at the 3D10 print program again, um, but this time we're going to do it in 6502 Assembler, which is going to give me a good excuse to um, demo off the assembler that's built into BBC Basic, that's something I've been meaning to do for a while. So the way we'll do this is we'll start with the original program that uh, we wrote last time around before there was any crunching, and we'll gradually convert it line by line into assembly language. Um, if you've forgotten what the original program does, um, you run it and you get this sort of 3D effect, um, which looks like the lights coming down from the top left uh, and so on. So the program, uh, parts of the program do things like set up the screen mode, define characters and the color palette and so on, and then the, the bulk of it is, uh, is generating the, uh, the 3D look pattern. Now, before I set about writing any assembler, I'm just going to tweak the program a little bit to make it more equivalent to the assembly language version. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is, uh, in the original program, I toggled B by doing not B, which changes B between 0 and minus 1. And instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to exclusive or it with 128, which is going to have the effect of changing it between 0 and plus 128. Now that has an advantage that this is easier to do in assembler, um, but lower down here when I get to change the colour, this is uh, this complicated calculation becomes much simpler in assembler. Um, so because B is now either 128 or 0, I don't need to multiply it by 128, and because it's plus 128 instead of minus 1, um, I also don't need a plus there, I need a minus. And I do the same thing on the next line. I don't need to multiply by 128, and the minus changes to a plus. And one final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move this plus 1 to the end, because that's going to make things a little bit more um, obvious uh, when you see the assembly language version. And the final thing I'm going to do is, instead of counting from 0 to 39 as we go along the columns, along a row of the screen, I'm going to count from 40 um, down to 1 using the loop here, which doesn't change anything in basic, but, but you'll see it, it's more equivalent to the assembly language version. So with that, I'm just going to change the file name, um, and I'm just going to run it again, and just confirm that it does indeed do the same thing, um, so I'm not changing the wool over your eyes or anything like that. Okay, let's bring up the editor again. So the first thing um, that you want to do when you're writing assembly language in BBC Basic is you need to reserve some uh, memory to store your code. And you do that using the dim statement. And like all basics, BBC Basic will let you create an array of numbers like that. Um, but it has a secondary format of this dim command, which is you put the number without brackets. And that means reserve some memory. And it reserves the number of bytes that you specify, uh, plus one. Um, and it puts the first address of, uh, of that in the variable you specify. So this will reserve 201 bytes of memory and it will put the address of the start of that block in the variable code percent. Then what you need to do is set a magic variable p percent um, and that will be the address where the assembler starts assembling code to. And we want it to start assembling code at the beginning of this block. Then to actually enter the assembler, you put an open square bracket um, which in Teletext mode, mode 7, appears as an arrow pointing to the left, but the effect is the same. And then I'm just going to put opt3. Uh, I'm not going to explain what that means at the moment, but it'll become more important and obvious in a moment. And um, Before we get on to writing the, uh, converting the actual program, what I'm going to do is just write a simple little assembly language program that prints a capital A on the screen, just to demo that the assembler is actually working and, and, and that it's, uh, you know, it's assembled the code correctly. So to do that, I'm going to use an operating system function, a print a character. And that first needs you to load the accumulator with the character you want to print. So I want to print a capital A, which has an ASCII value of 65. Um, but actually, every time you refer to a number in the assembler in BBC Basic, you're actually just evaluating a basic expression. So I can write something a bit more meaningful like that to remind me why that number 65 is there. And this could be more complicated. I mean, this could do all sorts of things like calculations and so on. But of course, in this case, I just want the ASCII value of a capital A. Then to actually print the character, I'm going to jump to a subroutine. And it's an operating system subroutine called operating system write character. And this is the operating system function that uh, writes a character onto the screen. Now, I haven't told it um, where that operating system function is at the moment. It doesn't magically know. So I've got to define that, um, that location. Now, this is one of the really good things about uh, the assembler here, is that the 
variables that you use inside the assembler are shared between that and the basic that's outside. So to define that location, I can just go outside the assembler part and I can define the address of that function. Um, and you specify hexadecimal numbers in BBC Basic with an ampersand in front. So that will call the operating system function to print a character. Then I want to end the program, so I'm just going to do RTS, return from subroutine, and that will drop back to wherever I called the program from, which in this case is going to be uh, BASIC itself with the command line. Once I'm finished, I exit the assembler with a closed square bracket that appears as an arrow pointing to the right in mode 7. And then I'm back in BASIC where I can type all the normal commands. So what I'm now going to do is I'm just going to print some information about the code that was assembled. Um, so the first thing I want to do is print the address where the code was assembled to. And you can print a hexadecimal number in BBC BASIC by putting a tilde, which appears as a divide by sign, uh, in mode 7. And then I want to print the size of the program. Um, and one thing that happens uh, with this p% percent variable is it increases as the program is assembled and it will always point to the location where the next instruction is to be assembled. So when we get to the end of the program, p% percent will actually be pointing at the byte after where the program finished. So if I print p% percent minus code% percent in hex, we'll get the hexadecimal size of the program. Then I'll end the program and just put a colon there to uh, separate the lines out. So now if I run the program, and save it. It's always a good idea to save your program before running it when you're writing assembly because if you make any mistakes you can end up sort of trampling over uh, the code and corrupting it. So what's happened now is you can see that it has assembled the code. Uh, it starts at 9A0 and in the middle you can see all the opcodes being generated and on the right you can see the assembler mnemonics. So this has assembled the code to address 9A0 and if I run that you can see it prints a capital A on the screen. So that just shows the assembler sort of basically working and we can move on to actually converting the program. So back into the editor. Um, the first thing we need to do is set up the screen mode and the color palette, um, which is the VDU-19s, and define the little triangular characters I need to make the effect. Now we can do that just by printing a lot of um, control codes using the operating system write character function that we've already used to print the A. Um, and we can change a screen mode by using VDU22 followed by the mode that we want to change into. So that's directly equivalent. Now, a lot of people suggested that I do this in the original program to change the screen mode because it, it looks smaller if you sort of condense it onto a, a line down here with the, the other VDUs. But you should never do this in BASIC because um, when you change the screen mode directly like this, uh, the, the new screen mode can use more memory um, and it can end up um, trampling over basic stack or, or even corrupting the program if you're not careful. Um, when you use the mode command in basic that will call an operating system function to find out how much memory is needed by the new screen mode and if there's not enough memory it will produce an error and things like that. So you shouldn't do that in basic typically but in machine language it doesn't matter it's up to you to check that you're not about to um, overwrite the main memory of the program and all that kind of thing. So all we need to do to um, set all of this stuff up is just basically emit all these control codes. Um, so we need to just like a a write a routine to do that. So what I'm going to do is just going to move all these VDU statements up into the assembly language section and we'll convert them to be a lot of bytes stored in the program. So I'm going to use control M twice to mark the beginning and end of the block that I want to move. Control B up here to move it before this line. Press F0 to execute it and I'll just stick a colon in there to separate things out. So now I need to transform these VDU statements into a, a bunch of bytes that the assembler is just going to store directly and not try and interpret as machine language instructions or anything. So I do that by using EQUB which means equate byte and that just means store this byte in memory. Now unfortunately you can't do what I've done here with a comma and it doesn't produce an error but it actually only stores the first byte. Um, if you want to store multiple bytes you need to write multiple EQUBs, and you can put more than one statement on a line in the assembler just like you can in BASIC. So I basically just need to convert all of these into EQUBs. Um, and there is a something that can help me here make this a little bit smaller. Um, as well as equate byte, there's also an equate word which will store a 16-bit value um, with the least significant byte first. And there's an EQUD which will store a double-size word which is a 32-bit number. So this 4 here is actually 
just four followed by three zeros, that's a 32-bit number. Um, and that's actually what it means because it's a 32-bit color value. So I'm going to store that there, I'll store the 19. Um, and I'm just going to work my way through these. Uh, that should be a double, get rid of all of those. And just to make, uh, well, just to make things a little bit easier to read, I'm going to split that line there and put those two color sets on different lines. Then what we need to do is just convert all of these, which is unfortunately quite tedious. Um, just have to sit here watching me mistype all of this. Um, that one and let's just split that before we move on to the next character um, uh, two four one press all the wrong delete keys here nearly done right so now I've got my block of bytes that I need to print out as control characters. I need some way to refer to the start of that block and how many bytes are in it. So what I'm going to do is put a label at the start of the block and you do that in the assembler by using a leading dot and then you put the label that you want to refer to that location. Um, and this actually just defines a basic variable with the location of that label, which will be whatever p% percent is at the point where it runs it. So that will set that to be the beginning of that block. Um, and then to indicate where the end is, I'm going to put another label down here like this. So now I need to write a routine just to um, print all of those control characters out and stop when it reaches the end. So this is quite a common thing that you have to do in 6502, sort of iterate over a block like this. Um, and it's easy to do. I will just delete these two lines though to start with. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is set the X register to zero. Um, which is going to be the counter as it goes through the um, the block of control bytes. I'm going to set up a label loop that I'm going to jump uh, around to to print each character. I'm going to load A with whatever is at the address VDU set at the start of the table plus X and then I'm going to jump to the operating system write character function. Then to move on to the next character I'm going to increase X and I'm going to compare X to see if we've reached at the end and we'll know we've reached at the end when X reaches the number of characters in that block and we can calculate that by doing that which is just an expression obviously like a basic calculation then if they're not equal we're going to jump back to loop and print the next character so this will just basically go through this big block of control characters and uh, print them out and we'll just stick a comment up here so we remember what this does um, there we go. Right, so let's run the program and we get an error at line 80. So let's see what's at line 80. So 80 is this function, uh, well, it's this instruction that loads in the next byte of this table. And it told us there was no such variable. And the reason for that was that by the time we got to this point to assemble this instruction where we needed to know the address of VDU set, we haven't actually got to VDU set yet. So we can't store that address um, in memory um, because we don't know what it is. Uh, so this is where the opt part comes in. And like most assemblers, um, BBC Basic is a has a two pass assembler um, where the first pass you go through just assembling the code and you might not know the location of some of the addresses referred to in that code but what you do is you just skip over those um, those cases and you just store some old junk in the place where the address would go and you get all the way to the end and when you get to the end you should have all the memory locations worked out because you've assembled all the code it's just that you've stored all the wrong addresses in the places where you needed to know them so then what you do is you go back and you assemble the code a second time and this time you should know all the uh, the addresses that you need to know um, and if you encounter a variable with a, a label in it that you don't know then you stop with an error because obviously you made a mistake and it's the wrong label so you do that in bbc basic by just making a for loop um, and this is where the opt part comes in so i'm going to do that and i'm going to change that to that um, and I'm just going to go down to the end of the assembly and I'm going to do next to go in the loop again. So what this does 
is um, this obviously assembles the code twice, once with opt zero and once with opt being three. Now opt is actually a bit field and the least significant bit, what you get when you add one, is a bit that controls whether a listing is printed on the screen. So we had that turned on a moment ago and that's why we saw the output of all the assembly language instructions. The next bit, which is what you get when you add two, is the one that controls what happens when an, un, uh, an unknown label or variable is encountered while the code is being assembled. So because we had that set, that meant that if any unknown variable was encountered during the assembly, it would stop with an error, which is what we saw. But if you have that variable clear, it causes it to just insert some garbage in that location, um, and then it will just continue and then populate all the uh, label variables as it goes through. So we can then go back later and fill it in. Um, so the first time we're going around, we're just really just working out all the addresses, although we are doing the assembly. And the second time, we're going to print a listing of all the code that's assembled, and we're going to fill in all the correct addresses. Um, so that's all that does. And let's just try that a second time. There we go. So that's actually assembled the code. And if we just run that again, um, you can see that, um, I'll just stop that. You can see that now that um, LDA VDU set X line that's at address AD2, you can see that the address that's being written in there is, it's written backwards because the, the 6502 is little endian, is OA followed by DE. And if you look down here, you can see that the VDU set label is at address OA DE. So if we run that code again, that's all assembled. Call code percent. Um, well, or we can just run it at the address that it says it is. And then that will do all of the uh, setup part of the program. Uh, and that shows it's worked. Well, hopefully it has. Let's have a look. So firstly, I'm in some screen mode that looks like mode one, because I've got square brackets uh, and a backslash, which I wouldn't have in the teletext mode I was in a moment ago. The other thing is that uh, color one has been redefined to be a dark blue. Color two has been redefined to be cyan, and color three is white, and we've already seen that because that was the first color on the screen. And the other thing that should have happened is characters 240 and 241 have been redefined to be these little triangular colors, uh, characters. Um, so that all seems to have worked. Um, now you may remember that I said don't change screen mode um, when you're in basic with the uh, with the VDU statement, and and obviously I just did that, even though although it was in assembly language, I still had a basic program loaded. Now, it didn't matter in my case because I'm using a tube processor, and when you're running a tube processor, the memory where your program is stored is in the tube processor, and the screen memory is stored in the host processor um, side of the the system, so that the two memory spaces are completely separate. So although I did change to a screen mode that used more memory. It, didn't have anything to do with the program, uh, the memory space used by the program I'm using, so there's no problem with corruption. So now we've got the uh, screen set up, um, we can move on to the next part of the code. So what I'll do is just go down to the bottom here and we'll move this bit of basic um, up into the assembly language bit. There we go, put a colon in there just to separate things out. Um, so now what we want to do is gradually change this program line by line um, into assembly. So the first thing we need to do is set B to be zero. Now on the 6502 you have, well you've got two places you can store in, store numbers like a variable. One of which is the registers, um, of which you only have three useful ones, A, X and Y, and that's not really very many. So you, you have to be very careful about how you use them and you can't store a lot in them. Um, and in particular, the X and Y ones can only do very basic things like increase and decrease. Um, so the other place you can store a variable is just by storing it in a memory location, and that's what I'm going to do with B. So to store B in a memory location as a variable, I'm going to first load the accumulator with the uh, number I want B to be, and then I'm going to store B in a memory location like that. Now I haven't told it where I want it to store B, um, but that's where I need to go back up the top here and define another variable. Um, so I'm going to store B at address hex 70. Um, and I, that's an address in zero page, the first 256 bytes of memory. And in particular, 70, I think up to 8F, are addresses that are left free by BASIC for you to, to uh, write your own things into if you're writing your own machine language or for some reason you need a bit of zero page memory. And BASIC won't use those, so you can use them safely without corrupting BASIC. So that sets 
b to 0. Um, and then we need to start making this loop. Um, and I don't actually need to do anything to start a loop apart from define a variable um, or a label that is going to be the start of the loop so I can jump back to it. That's that next line converted. So next thing we need to do is do b, e, or 128, exclusive or 128. So that's easy. I just load the accumulator with b. I do e or uh, 128 and then I store the accumulator back in B. Uh, that might seem a bit superfluous uh, superfluous doing all of this because um, the uh, accumulator is already storing B because I set it up here um, but the next time I go around the loop the accumulator won't be holding B so I do need to load it like this. So that does that. The next thing I need to do is um, iterate over the columns in a row. So I'm just going to Create a comment there, and I'm going to use the Y register for this um, because I happen to have that spare during the program. And I'm just going to load it with the number 40, so that replaces that line. Um, it obviously doesn't replace all the bit where it gets decreased and checked to see if we've reached the end, but we'll be doing that at the end of the loop. Next thing I'm going to do is make a loop for each row, and we need to do this E or again. I'm just going to copy that line down there, replace that. That's easy. Um, so now we're on to getting a random number. Now this is this is quite tricky um, because there is no sort of operating system call or easy way to get hold of a random number on a, a tube system. Uh, you don't have access to the hardware so you can't do things like read the uh, read the chips of the timers and all that kind of thing. So every time you, you want to get something like a random number here we're going to have to use a, um, a write our own function to do that. So I'm going to use a random number function that I stole from the uh, BBC Elite website by Mark Moxon. Um, now this is a, uh, the algorithm is actually used to create the explosions when a ship blows up in Elite. Um, so I'm just going to write a comment, a random number, uh, and we're going to jump to a subroutine to get a random number, I'm going to call that rand z. Now I need to write rand z, um, so I'm going to go down here into the code, um, and I am going to write it here. Now, I'm not going to claim to understand how this algorithm works, um, but it is one of these um, one of these linear feedback shift register um, functions that uh, seem to be the common way to generate random numbers. Um, so what this does is it takes a block of four bytes and it, um, it does stuff with them um, so that each time you call this, uh, this function, the numbers in those uh, those bytes get all sort of shuffled around and changed and all that kind of thing. And the end result is that each time you call it, those numbers are effectively randomized. Now they, they will actually repeat after a, a number of iterations to this, but that, that number of iterations should be around 2 to the 32, so about 4 billion. Um, so I'm not too worried about that for my program. Um, so this is probably good enough for my needs. So. There we go. So that's the random number um, function. Uh, it operates by shuffling four bytes in this rund buff, um, and we need to create rund buff. So I'll go down here and do that, and I'm going to reserve double space 32 uh, bits, i.e. four bytes of space for this random number. And I'm also going to reserve an extra byte for a reason I'll come on to in a moment. Um, so I actually want five bytes of space here. So that's fine, but we need to seed this random number generator. If I put all zeros in there, in the in the, in the buffer that I just created, then I just get zeros out. And we want to initialize that. And if I was to hard code a number, I'd get the same numbers out each time. Um, so I want to generate a little bit of randomness each time I run the program. And the way I'm going to do that is by calling the um, operating system function to retrieve the current value of the interval timer, which is a timer that ticks up every hundredth of a second and is five bytes long. Um, and that will, it will at least give us a kind of random seed that's different each time we run the program. So the way I'm going to do that is just after setting up the screen, um, I'm going to call the operating system function to read the interval timer. So Comment there about that. 
And the way I do this is by using what's called an OSWORD operating system call. And this is just a series of uh, different functions all identified by a different number in the accumulator. And this one happens to read the interval timer in OSWORD call one. But there are OSWORD calls that do things like read and write blocks of data from the network or the disk or, or whatever. Um, so all of them take the same pattern though, which is you load the accumulator with the function number and you load X with the address of a um, the least significant byte of an address where you want the, uh, the, the either to send or receive data from the function and you load Y with the most significant byte uh, of where you want to do that and then you jump to this operating system um, call called OSWORD. Now I haven't defined what OSWORD is yet but I'll just go up to the top here and define that to be address FFF1. So this is going to initialize the random number generator seed by calling the operating system function to read the interval timer. And then when we get down here to want to retrieve a random number, we're going to call this random number linear feedback shift register function. And then we'll get a different set of bytes in that block, uh, four bytes each time we call it. So that the last byte, the, um, the fifth byte of the interval timer, which I believe is the most significant one, um, is just going to get ignored, but that doesn't really matter. I mean, it's, it's all we're really interested in here is the, we want a random number that's either zero or one. So what I'm going to do here is I'm after calling run Z, um, then I'm going to load the accumulator with the bottom byte of the random buffer. Um, I'm then going to and it oops, with one to either get a, um, a zero or one. So I'm basically going to mask off all the bits except the least significant one. And then I'm going to store that number in Z. Um, so that's basically going to do the same thing as this line below. Now, I haven't told it where to put Z is yet, um, but I'm going to put it in address seven one, which is another address that basically is free for me. So back down here, we've done that conversion. So the next thing we need to do is set the colors, um, these two color statements. Now, when you use color in BBC Basic, what you're really doing is emitting control code 17 followed by the color number that you want. So this is basically all that's doing. Um, so we can use the uh, OS write character function in the same way we did to um, set up all the screen mode and the characters just to do this color change. So I'm just gonna put in a comment, set colors, and we're gonna print character. 17 and then we need to calculate 130 minus B so that's quite easy we load in 130 into the accumulator we set the carry flag and we subtract with carry uh, B and we jump to operating system right character now this is quite confusing about 6502 is that when you subtract um, the carry flag if it's set will only subtract B if the carry flag is clear it will subtract B and one more as well. So we just want to subtract B, so we need to set the carry flag, and I often get that wrong when I'm not thinking about it. So that will do that. Um, the next one we need to do is obviously a little bit more complicated. So we'll print character 17. Then what we'll do is we'll load A with Z. Um, we'll do an arithmetic shift left of the accumulator to multiply it by two, or we'll shift all the bits to the left. Then we'll set the carry flag and we'll add on B. Um, so that will add B and because we've set the carry flag, we're gonna add one more than B. So this is the add with carry operates the opposite way around to the way you subtract as if you set the carry flag, you're adding one more when you do the addition. So now I can do right character and that should do the same thing as that. And the final thing we need to do there is just print the custom character. Um, and that just involves loading the accumulator with 241 and we need to subtract Z. So we need to set the carry flag and subtract Z. Remember, if we set the carry flag, we only subtract the number we provide. And we'll jump to the operating system right character function. Next bit, I'm just gonna put the comment loop. Um, so we need to loop across the um, rows, across the uh, the columns, across the row. So I'm going to decrease Y, which is, remember, the counter for the columns across a row. And I'm going to do, if it's not equal to zero, I'm going to jump back to row loop back up here. And this is the reason why I'm, I set Y to 40 and decreased it rather than increased it, is in 6502 and a lot of assemblers, it's often free 
um, to check if a number um, becomes zero, in that you don't have to explicitly test for it. It's things like decrease, like this DEY that decreases Y. That will set the, um, the Z flag, which will tell you that a number is equal if that number becomes zero. So it avoids me having to explicitly check, have I reached column 40? It's, it's just easier to do it that way. So that will go across the um, columns across the screen. And if not, we're on the next row of the screen, so we just jump back to the main loop again. So I don't need these extra lines here. So this may be the program finished if I haven't made any mistakes. So I'll just renumber it. I'll save it and run it. And like I said before, it's a good idea to save your program before you run it and you realize it's trampling all over it and corrupting it. Um, and we'll call it and see if it actually works. And there we go. So we've actually got the same effect in 6502. I can pause it with Control and Shift, um, but what I can't do is break out of it because checking the escape key is something that you have to do explicitly. Um, and that's something basic does for you, but assembly language doesn't. So I, I can't actually escape out of this program. But I can jab the break key and then I can type hold uh, and then I get my program back, um, so I haven't lost it. Um, so that's really it. That's that's the whole program converted into um, 6502. Um, one, well, it's a couple of final things. Um, the first of which is I'm running this on a tube processor, so effectively I've got a one gigahertz uh, 6502 in here. Although the thing that's actually doing all the printing um, is the host processor, which is the two megahertz 6502. So if you remember when I demoed the basic version, it ran a lot slower on the built-in 6502. Um, and we can try this running on the built-in 6502, uh, the machine language version instead of the basic version, and see how that compares. So I'm gonna turn the tube off so we go back only to the built-in 6502. Um, press break, just change, well, I've got to change the screen mode. Now I haven't got the program in memory to type old anymore because we're now using the main memory inside the BBC. Um, we're not using the memory inside the tube processor. So if I was to type old, I'd get bad program. So the program isn't there, but I do have it saved um, on the file server so I can just load it in and run it. And so there's the same program again. We'll run it and it will assemble it. Um, and if all is good, you can see the address is much higher. Um, uh, we should get the same effect, which we do. So there's the same program running on the built-in 6502 without any sort of fancy tube processor stuff. At two, and so this is all going at two megahertz. Okay, so one final thing. Um, the original BBC Basic was the 6502 version that ran on the internal BBC processor or on the 6502 second processor. But the tube architecture did in fact support a variety of different processor types and a variety of different models were made by Acorn. And one of the nice things about the PyTube Direct um, tube processor emulator is that it can emulate a variety of these different processor models, some of which were actually available at the time, um, but some of which were, were not. Um, so for example, I don't think there was a PDP-11 uh, tube processor. Um, but I can select between them just by using a software command. So I'll do this. Um, that selects second processor number four. Press return and jab control break. And we're resetting into a Z80 tube processor. And we've dropped into Z80 basic. Now the reason I've got Z80 basic is it's uh, it's an extra sideways ROM that I've had to load in in bank seven. Um, and the another clever thing about the Acorn operating system is one of the bytes in the sideways ROM header was reserved for the processor architecture. So when you switch between different processor types on the tube, um, it's able to scan down the sideways ROMs and look for one of the correct architecture. So in this case, it's found the Z80 basic and it doesn't try and load up, say, the BBC 6502 basic, which would obviously not go down very well. Now, the Z80 BBC Basic, which was written by Richard Russell um, and is released with the official Acorn product, um, that uh, is actually completely compatible with the um, BBC 6502 Basic um, and it can even load in the tokenized save programs. So this is the original uh, program before we did any crunching. Um, it looks a bit different on the screen, partly because I'm in mode zero, the 80 column mode, and that's because the Z80 tube processor defaults um, to mode zero because it was designed to run CPM. Uh, and another thing is the Z80 Basic defaults um, to indenting all the uh, loops and things on the screen, which you can do in the 6502 Basic by uh, by typing list 07 for list option 7. Now this should just run, um, 
and it will give the same effect that it does in the uh, 6502 version. Um, and the PyTube Direct um, does, it emulates the Z80 at sort of full speed, so it's it's going probably at several, seven, several hundred megahertz. Um, but one more interestingly, um, the idea of having an assembler built in to BBC Basic was carried across into different versions of it very often. So in this case, Richard Russell included a Z80 assembler in the BBC Basic um, version. And you can see it's used in exactly the same way as the 6502 version. So you do things like reserve memory with the dim statement, you can set variables and use them in the code and calculate expressions, you use a for loop with opt and the square brackets to go into the assembler and so on. The only difference is obviously the, the assembler itself is uh, Z80 rather than 6502. Now I'm not a Z80 programmer, um, so this is probably horrible and someone's probably screaming at the screen that I've done something really disgusting, but um, but I did get it to work. It took me a little while to remember how to use all the registers because I haven't written any of this since I had a Spectrum. Um, but there you go, that's the same program but written uh, in Z80 assembler. And if I run it, it assembles and prints all the um, opcodes and mnemonics and so on on the screen. And if I run the code, then I get the same effect, um, which is, there you go. So it all runs under the Z80, and like the 6502, the escape key doesn't work. Um, and this tradition of including an assembler actually continued on into the ARM version of BBC Basic, so you could fire that up and you could write some ARM code in there instead. Um, but anyway, I hope you found that interesting and uh, maybe even useful, and see you next time.